Today's class is entitled, the James Tanner will be our presenter and he will be talking about uploading to Family Search Memories, which is an important part of the program. And we will uh, appreciate his uh, preparation, his knowledge and his willingness to share both with us and help us uh, enhance our experiences and, and uh, capabilities in Family Search. We'll turn the time now over to James. Okay. Okay. Well, um, the, I think the the title, the complete title of the pro, of this presentation is processing photos and documents for upload to Family Search Memories. Uh, part of the part of the whole challenge of putting memories up online is having them in the proper um, format, the way that they're that it's possible for the computers to upload and, and make them part of the memories program. So we're going to go through the whole process and kind of explain all the background and the things that that are um, necessary to understand. First of all, the whole idea here is that when you have paper memories, whether they be photographs or documents or certificates or whatever it is, uh, there are uh, the value of them is uh, incalculable in some cases. They're they're tremendously valuable, but they're tremendously local. In other words, if you're holding a photograph, a paper photograph of one of your ancestors, relatives or whatever, family members, uh, you have it and you can enjoy it and then you have the information that it contains, but uh, there's no way for anyone else to see it unless you actually physically give them a copy of the photograph. I mean, hand them the photograph and then they can see that photograph. Um, Making copies of photographs and documents over the years was uh, and has been remarkably expensive in a sense, uh, getting double of what we used to do. And this is kind of a little bit step back into history uh, for some of you, prep, perhaps even before you were born. But for other of us, we have been around a long time that uh, these things are all part of our background. And that is when we did photographs, it was all on film. It was photographic film in a camera. And if we wanted multiple copies, we had to uh, order them when we had the, the film duplicated or take in the negatives from the film and have them uh, reproduced again. So it was not unusual when we would uh, have a roll of, of pictures, for example, on our cameras when we took took the film and had it developed that we would say we want three or four copies of each one or even a half a dozen, if, depending on what kinds of things. But those still are those individual photograph copies are there. Uh, that process uh, was not, uh, is not what you would call very efficient. Um, there was a big, big step up in making copies when uh, photocopying, uh, meaning uh, what we might call Xerox copying, copying or uh, uh, that type of, of reproduction in copy machines that are now almost everywhere, basically uh, allowed us to do very poor <laughs> copies in that day in black and white. And so they were all black and white photo photocopies and uh, the, the digital, the images of those were very uh, usually very poor. As technology changed, so did our ability to share information. And uh, eventually we got to the point where there was a scanning process that was developed that would allow us to scan an image and create a computer file of the, of the digital image. So that kind of broke us free of the paper and we were able to to uh, have digital copies. Over the years, that ability to do that has become uh, greater and greater as the, you have a greater ability because of two factors. One is uh, the uh, size of storage capacity and the cost of, of uh, storage uh, digital files has dropped uh, immensely. The, the difference today uh, for a few cents or less than a hundredth of a cent per copy if, if you want to look at it in some ways, hundred, hundredths of a percent per, to, per copy. Uh, 
because now uh, storage for computers is uh, is vir virtually unlimited. You you have there's no top upper limit in the amount of information that you can store, and uh, even if you're information today and you think well you know that isn't quite true because you still have to pay for it but the, the cost of that uh, of it for example i just replaced one of my hard drive two of my hard drives with a 16 terabyte hard drive which cost me about 320 dollars on a per copy per uh, image basis the the tens of thousands hundreds and hundreds of thousands of images that i could keep on that drive are down to uh, almost hundreds of a, of, a, per, of one cent per image. So we're, you know, the, the, from the standpoint of, of memory, this is, uh, we're in a, an entirely different world than we started out at uh, many years ago when hard drives were expensive and, and uh, people worried about the size of the memory of how much memory they had on their computer that it would hold. Uh, what if you could even copy a, a photograph because it may it may have too much memory and so a lot of the things that I'll talk about today have to do with with overcoming this idea that there's an issue with with how much memory we're using to to store information and and move that information. Additionally, uh, on Family Search, there is a an ultimate limit of the number of of uh, of items that you can upload at uh, a, a set amount of of memory for each of those items, and so uh, when you reach that, there's simply no more capacity on that particular on one individual. But but if you uh, uh, can spread it out over a family and and uh, obviously get a lot of of images, and it's into like a thousand uh, images or more, uh, so. Being on that kind in that kind of situation, it really isn't. Uh, uh, there are no limits that most people are going to run into, um, and in uh, digitizing their photos and documents. So this is something you can just do and and do it as uh, you know as expeditiously and as best you can. And we'll talk about some ways of doing that better. So you're really looking at three. Uh, three different types of electronic equipment. We have cameras and we have uh, what we would now, I'm going to call generically smartphones. And then we have uh, dedicated scanning devices. Uh, this is a flatbed called a flatbed scanner. And there are other kinds of scanners or page scanners and high speed scanners that will flip images through. And there's book scanners and there's other kinds of of lots of uh, kind of an ultimate number. But for people in their own home, uh, these are the kinds of things that you're most likely to use. And there really isn't any difference. They're all scanning devices. Um, if you have a very old camera and you're using a very old di digital camera, you may want to uh, upgrade your camera to something. Uh, there's some threshold uh, areas in uh, in camera resolution, and we'll talk a little bit about resolution here in a minute. But this is uh, these are the the options that are basically available. Is one better than the other? No. Is one preferable over the other? Not really. Uh, they're all completely good, completely valid, and they they do the job. Uh, from the standpoint of the quality of the scanned image. Uh, a flatbed scanner is preferable because it holds the document flat. <laughs> so you have a paper document that's flat. And uh, so it's even all over and it's not skewed and not, doesn't have, it has everything uh, on the document or image uh, visible. So uh, there's some, there's some advantage, slight advantages to using a flatbed scanner or some other type of scanner than it is to use cameras and and uh, and smartphones, but the best camera or scanner is the one you have with you. So if you're doing, if you're traveling, or if you happen to go to a relative's house, this has happened to us uh, any number of times. I can't imagine how many times uh, where we go and they say, "Oh, we have these. You would like to see the photos?" And so we are, you know, presented with 
a number of photos. Well, if you don't have your camera or your scanner with you, you know, sometimes you have to say, well, can I borrow these and bring them back to you? And a lot of people, uh, surprisingly, do not want you to do that. And so they will just, uh, so you may lose the opportunity to to capture that information or those documents or those letters or whatever it is. But if you have your camera, if you have your camera with you, which uh, some of us now carry a camera like virtually all day long every day, and that's a smartphone, we can you can use that to take pictures. And they're perfectly acceptable and perfectly uploadable to, to uh, Family Search and any other website where you happen to be using to uh, host your photographs and documents. So th this is uh, this is a screenshot of this. It's an image of the uh, of some of the equipment at the BYU Family History Library, and we have a rather extensive amount of of uh, very sophisticated. Uh, digitizing equipment. The, the, what we have here is a whole range of flatbed scanners, uh, some very large for very large documents. That's where it starts to get a little bit interesting. And some are much are, are quite high, uh, high resolution if that if becomes a factor in how and what you're trying to accomplish. We also, also have book scanners and all the other types of scanners that I've mentioned for slides, for, for uh, video, uh, eight millimeter uh, film for uh, movie film for uh, uh, all types of, 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 of CDs and all these kinds of things. Anytime you've got an, a, a, a type of, of one of the older, I'd say, historically uh, active type way of capturing images, we have something at the BYU library that will probably transform that to a computer and to a computer file that can then be uploaded to uh, Family Search. Uh, so, why Family Search? Now, why are we talking about Family Search other than the fact that we're Family Search missionaries? We work at the BYU Family History Library, which is uh, part of the sponsor of uh, Family Search, which is sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The reasons are very simple. First of all, it's free. Second, second of all, Family Search, I mean, Family Search website, familysearch.org is free. Uploading the memories is free. And uh, as far as all of us are concerned, uh, it is about as permanent and as, and as reliably uh, going to be there in the future as any possible other venue, any other place you could put your, your memories. So uh, if you want to put them in a commercial website someplace, you better be careful that you have a backup or some way to transfer those to some other website because it's there's no guarantee that any of the commercial websites will or... Um, individually sponsored programs would uh, will be maintained long uh, for a long time into the future but uh, family search isn't going anywhere and this is uh, it's it's going to be as permanent as anything is at this point in life well this is called the gallery view of the memories uh, if you do some exploration on familysearch.org website you'll find that there's uh, this section and if you find out that there, if you open it and there's no photos in there then that means you probably don't have very much information in your family tree because this uh, as you go out and get more uh, people that are directly connected to you through the family search family tree uh, who are related then they will start appearing here even though you may not have any idea who they are or where they came from they're uh, they're officially your relatives, and so they are people who will be supplying information and, and uh, have show up here in the gallery. This is really helpful for people who have, who have nothing and don't know anyone uh, who is a relative and have no photographs of their family. Well, by starting this and getting involved and putting your own photographs up, uh, you'll be, be uh, you probably, hopefully, pleasantly surprised to find out that you have uh, a lot of relatives and they have a lot of photographs. And right now uh, we're up to, on mine, they're up to about 3,200 uh, plus photos. 
And not all of those are mined by any means, uh, although a very large portion of them are for a lot of different reasons. So if you have digital images that are already, I mean, in other words, you've got things sitting on your phone or you're uh, sitting on your hard drive for your computer or on a flash drive somewhere, and you have all these images sitting there, then you, there's nothing much more you have to do in this than it is to upload those to Family Search. And uh, once you upload them, then they're available. And there's a process that I'll talk about that that where you identify them and tag the individuals who are in the photos so that uh, they're usable and have the, the little titles here, which are very important. If you go on to your memory section and they have all these pictures, but all the, the places where you see the text on this screenshot, if those are all blank, that means you haven't given them all titles. So you just have to click on it identify it as with a title and then that title will show up on the gallery indicating what the what is the content of uh, that particular image and then when you get into it you can uh, do many else now previously there was a fairly complicated process of uploading the images to family search in the last very short time in the last month or two from the date of this presentation, um, that changed. And now there's just one button. There's no division between photos and documents and other things or anything. Uh, basically, there's a blue button up in the right-hand corner of the screen that you can see right under the name of the person there. And that just clicks and adds memories. And all you do is add them, and they're all in this one area. There's no longer a division of type or everything. Now there are, they do get um, basically divided uh, as you do. There's a very rough division. And if you look at it, you've got this, this a blow up of that part of the image over there now on the left side that has the add memories. And if I click on the add memories, I have a choice. It can be an audio, it can be a story, which is text, and then everything else is files. So no distinction between documents, no having to worry about, is this a document, is it not a document? I mean, the the, uh, the biggest issue uh, underlying this all along was, is a picture of a grave marker, a photo, or is it a document? And so that was the kind of things that we were discussing. And then they uh, finally search, finally realized that the difference didn't make any difference and that nobody really cared if it was a picture or a document. And so therefore they've consolidated all that into one click. So once you're there and how you get those into the family search program is you click on your image on your computer or you run it over and, uh, and drop it in. When you, uh, when you get the image over the blue dot, it will turn into a place where you can drop the image and upload it automatically. Then you're in the process, of course, of, of um, having the uh, of having to put more information in on the image. Oh, stop. So when you get there, you'll see it says add a file. And you can add it from your device. There's, you can also do this or your gallery already, if it's there already online, or you can do it from Google Photos, which is uh, an online storage from Google. And if you have Google Photos, for instance, for example, on your uh, smartphone, then it will automatically copy all of your photos there's a limit to the amount of information you can have on Google, and you may end up having to pay a fee, an annual fee or whatever, to, to get enough information if you start using Google Photos too consistently. But uh, it is an option, and the, it can be in any of those places and add a file directly to uh, the Family Search memory section. Now, you're going to see a list of, uh, of file formats, and, and in just a minute, I'll go through those and explain what the differences are and why you choose one over the other, or if you even have a choice or care. Um, addition to that, you can add a, uh, 
up to 10 images. Um, and you can also mark them public or private. Now, there's no really, the, 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 object, the, the logic of putting them in as private is only if they were, if they are um, not, if they're living people or some other reason why you would not want to have their images online. Um, but the problem with that is doublefold. First of all, if if they're really if they're really not something you want to be public, my answer to that has always been and will always be: don't put it online. Don't bother to put it online until it's clear clearer that uh, you want everyone to see it because it's just not. And the problem here is if you mark them private. At the present time, there's some difficulty if you pass on, if you die, uh, your images are still private and there's presently no mechanism to make them public. So I don't know why you would do this. But you can also save a story and um, uh, right here and have a list, of, like I said, up to 10 images to go with that story that you've created. So you can create a story with up to 10 images. And there is a limit of the size of this story because you'll see zero of 144 and that's what it'll just be a countdown and tell you. You can also record a memory directly by just clicking there and starting to talk through the, the whatever microphone on your phone. And by the way, there are um, copy, what basically the same program in, uh, in app form for uh, Android and uh, Apple's iOS. So if you're if you have your smartphone, you can open the Memories app and go directly to and upload uh, images and and uh, so if you take a photograph with your iPhone with your iPhone or your Android phone, and then you're in that Memories app, that can be uploaded directly to the Memories uh, section of FamilySearch.org without any intermediary moving around the file or taking the file. It'll just take the photo directly up to the memory section and put a copy into your phone's photo gallery. So you'll still have that photograph on your phone. Okay, so there's this, this may sound a little bit complicated, but when you get into it, it's just straightforward. And it's, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's simple because there's some steps involved but it is something that once you've done a few times is, is uh, basically uh, easy to put in a lot of information uh, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. So once the image is uploaded, so this image was uploaded and I, uh, before I begin uploading the images, I give the file a name. Uh, in this case, uh, this file from where it's from and who it is, and uh, the date is the file name. And when I upload that file to the memory section of FamilySearch.org, then it automatically puts that in as the title to the uh, to the image. So that way, it's identified on my computer uh, or my phone, and it's also identified uh, once it's up in the memories. If you don't have a, a file, if it just comes up as saying a number or whatever the file is, is uh, created without a name, then uh, there's an edit the file option that lets you edit and change the file and add it. And as I mentioned a moment ago, this is the, the name that will appear in the gallery when it's uh, when you're looking at the gallery. So it helps to, to identify the uh, the good title identifies the subject matter, the date, and the place of what happened, and that way you can uh, those that puts it into uh, the context of the photo. Now, over on the right-hand side, there's a, a list of, and I'll blow that up a little bit. It's a list of things that are very, very important to put in. First of all, the a date. There really needs to be a date. And one of the challenges we have is that uh, we get a lot of photos if we get, like I have gotten thousands, tens, tens of thousands of photos from relatives over the years. And of those thousands of photos, uh, very few of them are actually identified at all. So it's 
it's been interesting. But as we start working, uh, one of the things coming out of Family Search uh, and that they're exploring is the possibility of having uh, artificial intelligence photo ad uh, identification so that uh, if you identify one photo, that it will go through and, and match it to all the other photos that you put up and say, all these photos seem to be the same person. And then you'll be able to put their, uh, the title and identify the people all at once. Uh, that technology is is available now and uh, will at least is being discussed uh, and actively pursued by family search. So we'll see what happens in the very near future with that. Um, the event place is is extremely important. Uh, it's not always possible to uh, to identify that, but uh, what we do know we should put in. Uh, and a date and a time will it will help that the, the photo to be further identified and, and used in the future. And you can see below that the file name is the file that was what was uploaded. And this particular file was a TIFF file, TIF file, and we'll and we'll talk about those files now. So family, they take <clears throat> these file formats. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, so we're we're talking about a number of different formats, and and I'm going to go through each of these file formats. But to explain the the concept of a file format, uh, there are literally hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of different file formats, um, and and perhaps as many as thousands over the last of the years that computers have been created. The problem with the with the and the challenge of having so many file formats out there is that um, uh, if you have an old file format that's abandoned for some reason, then the information that you have in that file may either be very difficult to to um, to open and examine, or maybe even impossible from the standpoint of not even being able to find a program that will do that. Now, the history of that, uh, I learned the hard way. And many of the things that I learned over the years, I learned by having terrible experiences with them. Uh, I had many years ago uh, began keeping my, my uh, personal journal on a computer in a format used by Apple called MacWrite. It was an old Macintosh program. And uh, I had many years of my of my journal on MacWrite, and uh, and then it, just because of uh, changing newer computers and and developing programs, I basically switched over to using Microsoft Word because I uh, just liked the program better, and it was uh, had more versatility, and I it was a better program at that time. Well, and then I went back. Uh, sometime later to uh and i wanted to make sure that i had all my early jur journal files for about the first eight or ten years of my journal or more and found out that they were unreadable and that there was nothing that i could find that would would, would read the files and so the only thing we found is because because at the time we were uh my brother and and uh, my and I were uh, running a, a computer business, and we had been uh, stashing our old computers back in the back room of our office. And uh, my brother was able to get one of the old computers out that had the MacWrite program, and he transferred that into a, what we called a text file, which is just a non-formatted file type of file, just straight information. And uh, I was able to recapture all of the of my uh, journal articles. Um, then the problem occurred because um, I had been writing in Mac Write, uh, excuse me, in uh, Microsoft Word for some period of time, and I uh, another eight or ten years of of journals or more, and uh, went back to try to. And then I was being hysterical, of course, and so then I went back and. Uh, was going to try to capture those and found out that all those Mac, all those Microsoft Word programs had been abandoned by Microsoft, and I couldn't read any of them with Word. 
with Microsoft Word. But I did find other programs online that were able to read uh, those files. So that taught me that uh, no matter what I was using at the time, I should make sure that I could migrate. And that's the key word here, migrate that file format into a currently used file format. Now, what is, why is that, it, what does that story have to do with these file formats? Well, these file formats that are listed here are the types of formats that um, are, are scheduled, if you want to call it that, uh, are so well accepted around the, the, uh, the, geneal the in technological community for computers that they cannot be abandoned. In other words, these are embedded now in the system that's being used by everyone to uh, record information. So everything that's possible will be used to um, have these preserved. And this is this is not just information that's coming from Family Search or from me personally or whatever. This is uh, this is the basic place to go in the United States to get the idea of what is and what is not preserved. And, uh, and we're not just talking about digital images. We're talking about paper and film and and even collectibles and anything that people have collected that they think should be preserved from a museum standpoint, from an individual standpoint, whatever it is, cloth, um, everything. They have under this Library of Congress Preservation Directorate, which is um, the... Uh, address is just it's under just look under it's hard to find on the library of congress website all you have to do is type is do a search for uh, preservation library of congregation uh, library of congress preservation and you have you'll go right right to this and it's called the preservation directorate and then it says preservation home which is what this is and then there's a list and uh, it will list every type of 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 item, anything that would possibly show up in the, any museum or any library or any archive, and then they have guidelines for how that those items should be preserved. So this is the key place as far as, as preservation is concerned. And they will link you out to lots of different sources with lots of information and and uh, and archiving supplies and all sorts of things come out of this preservation uh, directorate. But the key here is what I've said on screen is basically they recommend the same list of formats that I just went through with Family Search. So it's no coincidence because Family Search simply came here, found out what was acceptable, and decided that they would emphasize those. So this is this is how that all came about, and this is where all those come from. Now, just in case you're saying, well, where do, what's the real list? This is a table of the, the real list, and uh, they're, they're gathered together in uh, by categories. And uh, you can see that there's a lot of different variety, and there's descriptions of how those, how each of those kinds of, of, uh, of files will, uh, will is what's good about them, what's not, what's not good about them, and why they're using them and talking about them. But you'll see that there's there's bitmaps, BMPs, and there's uh, the JPEGs and TIFFs and uh, PDF, and all that's on this list. So all of these are the ones that are and TIFF and uh, that are acceptable, with additional ones that are not recognized by Family Search but are still used, are still uh, used as different ones. So this, the particular, um, I've left, put that link on there, on the, on the uh, slide here to this particular uh, spreadsheet showing the uh, different types and how they all add up. Now, anything outside of those, anything specialized programs or whatever that create images that don't fall into these categories. There's nothing wrong. They're not going to vanish. They're not going to disappear. But there's no guarantee that they will be used in the future. So 
it, there's nothing that says that it, it adapts. It's it's always very important to to gravitate to these basic formats for whatever images you scan or or, uh, or use in your your camera or whatever else. Now I'm going to explain each one briefly because it it can get a little complicated and, and there's really nothing more than what I say that you need to know about these unless you're a photographer. When you get into uh, professional level photography, uh, this my my explanation will sound uh, tremendously simplistic. In other words, it's it's really simple. There's really a lot more you can say. And in fact, there are books written about and online, there's just an endless stream of discussion going on about all this. So, uh, you know, when you when you start moving into if you have aspirations of, of uh, doing photography professional, you will learn all this and uh, it will become kind of the basic background to everything you do in photography. Or if you're an archivist or if you're working in a library with archives or whatever you are, uh, if you are getting involved at that level, then then this this is not the complete end of the of the discussion. This is the simplistic view of it. So JPEGs are ubiquitous. They're everywhere, and they're the most commonly used uh, image format. And many smartphones only produce, and a lot of uh, of the cameras of digital cameras only produce JPEGs. So uh, you'll basically have a JPEG file, whether you like it or not. And uh, that's basically what you did. Now, you'll keep hearing the term lossy. Um, basically, JPEGs were created, as I started to uh, explain at the very beginning, when memory size was a major factor in an image. Uh, if you go back to the old floppy disks and the old uh, ways of storing information, uh, most of the images that I create today are too large and that would not even flip up, fit on one whole floppy disk. So you couldn't even get one image on a floppy disk. But today I can score, I can store tens of thousands, uh, thousands of images on my camera with a, uh, a SSD, a solid state device, a, a flash card or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but to, so today the, the size isn't important. The, from a photographic and editing standpoint, the lossy is important. All it means is every time you copy this, whether you when you first create it, it loses the ultimate amount of information that could be captured by the device. So uh, it's not good, it's not bad. From the standpoint of, of, uh, of uploading to family search and from the standpoint of genealogy, a JPEG is perfectly fine. And there's no, uh, the downside of a JPEG only becomes important if you are uh, working on it in a sort of a way that you're gonna edit that photo heavily or whatever. TIFF files uh, overcome that to some extent and they're lossless, meaning that most of the information is, is retained and the file size gets um, not you know markedly greatly increased. So the size of a JPEG file is, is relatively small. The size of a TIFF file is much larger. And then we get over into something that is not accepted by family search presently. And this kept, captures all the image information from a camera, and that's called the camera raw or raw images. Um, and just recently, if you have an Apple iPhone, and there are some of the other other brands of of uh, smartphones out there, uh, they will that you have software in the iPhone and the other camera, uh, the other smartphones that will take your images in camera raw. Now, the good part about that is, is it captures all the information if you're worried about it. The bad news about it is that there's there's not much you can do with the photo because it isn't developed at all. It's like an undeveloped photo and uh, you will have to process, probably end up processing that photo through uh, Photoshop or one of the equivalent type programs that, uh, when I say Photoshop, I mean Adobe Photoshop. and 
one of the programs on your computer. Uh, so it's not it's not convenient, uh, but it does preserve all the information and gives you a higher quality image, a higher resolution and quality image because it can be it can then be changed and saved as a TIFF file or saved as a JIP file or saved as a PDF file or whatever other file format you want. So there's you know there's uh, from professional standpoint from professional photographer standpoint. Uh, then that is uh, a camera raw is, is something that is ser ser seriously considered and usually possible. And not all cameras that were that have been made will capture raw images. So in a sense, you have to make sure that the device or the, the software that you're using will even do that if you're interested in, in getting all that information from the camera. Um, yeah, and I should mention, of course, that I am a professional and have been a professional photographer for years. Um, it's kind of my, you could call it a hobby, but it's more than a hobby because I spend a lot of time um, taking photos. Okay, so there's one other, there's some other image formats that are out there. Bitmap or BMPs are very common, and it's the Microsoft. This is Microsoft's uh, file format. And so you're likely to run into photos that are images online, uh, particularly or shared with you or whatever that come out as a BMP file. There's nothing wrong with a BMP. They're easily transferred as to, G, to JPEGs. Um, there are, and most, all of these file formats can be moved into one other ones, except you cannot, once you've got a raw photo, which is the total information, anything else you do has less information than the raw photo. And there's no way of going backwards. So you can't take a JPEG and turn it into a camera raw because that the camera raw has to be done at the time the image is taken and captured. So uh, even some of the devices today, like the scanners and things, there's a few of them are beginning to, to get into the idea that they could take a raw image picture. But uh, most of the, most of the, the, the uh, devices out there process the images as they take the images and turn them into one of these formats. PNG is called Portable Network Graphics Files, and this is something that was created. They're smaller files. Uh, they're very uh, fast. They, they're fast loading files, and they are uh, very much used in uh, web graphics, logos, charts, illustrations, things that, uh, that the quality of the image is not as important as how fast it can be uh, loaded on screen. So this is something you'll see uh, very commonly. And the last ones are Adobe's uh, uh, own photo file format that's called PDF, or uh, it's, uh, it's a portable data file. Basically, uh, for documents, PDF is, is very much desired because it's uh, a very easy to, to work with. There's a downside a little bit because everybody can read PDF files, but if you want to start editing them or exporting them as JPEGs or doing different things, reorganizing a PDF file, then you get into the problem of having to use programs that will uh, that will edit PDF files. And the, the main one is called uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro, the Pro version. And then there's an Adobe Acrobat, which is um, just a viewer that will view PDF files, but it's very limited in what it can do with a PDF file. So most of us who are uh, totally immersed in doing this kind of thing and moving uh, thousands of images a month, uh, basically what we're doing is uh, working with all of these forum file formats and uh, some of the software tools that we need uh, become uh, very important. Uh, this has been something we've been working with. I've been working with now for probably around 40 years. And it's um, it's basically just part of the background of the things that we have, uh, the Adobe programs, including Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom and Acrobat and all the other Adobe programs for, for creating all of the, the 
videos and, and presentations that I've been doing for the last few years. And then we, uh, th these, of course, will handle all of these other uh, programs that are out there. So there's, uh, and there's a lot of other uh, equally as good and some free programs that do, uh, that do a lot of the things that we're talking about. But from the standpoint of a genealogist who's simply interested in getting their information onto family search or getting your information uh, in a format that can be uh, transmitted or saved to to other people, members of the family, uh, there are simple tools that are built into uh, the most smartphones, and and you can send a, a photo, and you can send uh, a graphic once you have a ton of photo. Once you scan it into, uh, you can then transfer that to your phone, you can transfer it to your computer, you can transfer it, then it becomes part of the internet and part of the Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi world where, where documents can be floated around between the different devices. We probably need to do a, a class on how to move all this stuff around, but right now it's it's part of something else. Now we're moving into audio file and movie file formats. And so we have MP3s, which are compressed digital audio file formats. And these are the, this is the most common audio file. In fact, if I were independently recording this or recording a video, I would have an MP3 file when I got through or a WAV file. They're both the same. And the WAV was used by IBM and Microsoft. And so they're both very, very common and they're both interchangeable and most all programs will recognize either one. Um, and then the, the basic formula for common video format is called an MP4. And uh, this, is the, this is the format that's used if you want to put a video uploaded like uh, we do with the BYU Family History Library videos, they go up onto our our YouTube channel, and they're all in MP4 format. MP4 includes the sound. So the uh, MP4 does not need a separate MP3 file. It is all part of MP4. So you get audio and video at the same time. So those are the, those are the, the common formats. Uh, there's the pros and cons. There aren't any particularly. Um, they're all useful. They're all going to be... Uh, hit, used extensively in the future. No one's going to abandon them uh, logically, they don't, illogically. If you have created a device that didn't recognize some or all of those file formats, it would not be, you couldn't sell it. Uh, so it's uh, it's kind of embedded now in our society, in our, in our world. And the summary of that is the best file format is the one used by your digital scanning device. Whatever you're turning out is just fine and uh, you shouldn't be worried about it. Um, and if you, uh, you get up to the level of uh, understanding the, the nuances and difference between all these files, then you can get your opinion and use whatever you want. But you're still going to be constrained by the fact that that uh, family search will only take the ones that are on the list. And so anything else you want to try is uh, going to have to be adapted before you can upload it to family search. So a little bit of note here about resolution. Uh, I think it's important, and we'll run through this quickly. Um, basically, that as you, if you go to that Library of Congress website that I talked about, uh, the library, the preservation uh, directorate, they're going to tell you all you need is 200 to 300 DPI. If you go to the National Archives, all they're going to tell you is you need 200 to 300 DPI. Scanners today will do 36,000 DPI or some, you know, terrible, uh, huge size of mine. The reality of it is that your eyes can only discern 300 DPI images. If you have a dot matrix image, meaning it made up little dots at 300 dots per inch, and you hold it five or 10 inches in front of your face, you can't see the dots. Okay. So that's what it is. And the National Archives, uh, National Archives and Records Administration, our National Archives, clearly state through 200 to 300 DPIs, all they need for preservation. 
and you can read through all of this on the National Archives website. And I've left giving you that uh, link if you'd like to go in and look at the technical documents. Higher resolution gives you a larger file size and a larger print size, meaning you can print out a larger piece of paper. So what are the what is the resolution of these giant images that we're seeing here in Tokyo, for example, on the on the uh, uh, up here? <laughs> they are all at probably as low as seventy two or even lower uh, images dots per inch. If you were to look at those images, you would be uh, up close. You would see the dots, and they'd be big dots. Okay, so here's the difference. This is a photograph. This is what a photograph looks like. Okay, so this is an actual photograph. Actually, this was a glass plate photograph, meaning it was done on an old gla glass plate. If I zoom in on this photo, then I don't get any pixelation. What I do is I get granularity. I'm starting to see what looks like little grains, and those are the grains of the silver iodide that's used to create the image. So, uh, you know, it, and because it's on a screen, on a computer screen now that I scanned it or to get it into a scanning, then in a sense, you're still going to see some dots, some some of what they call the pixels, the, the individual image parts. So now if I go to another image, um, 10 points to anyone who knows where this is, uh, and I zoom in then you're going to start to see pixelations. Those are the little square blocks that are the, uh, the components of the sensors that create the images in digital devices. So you're gonna, that's what you'll see. And uh, in the old days, there were negatives, meaning they had to, the camera took a picture on a piece of negative film, and then it was printed on a piece of paper. So this celluloid or celluloid film was then, uh, just with a light was shined through it and it was paused. It was the, the colors were re the, the tones, the black and white tones were reversed and you got a positive image. So I, when I was digitizing a lot of my grandfather, grandmother's photographs, that's these photographs that you're looking at. Um, I had the original negatives. I had to build a, a, a light box sense where I could, uh, shine a light through the photo, the negatives in order to capture the digital images. And I was able to do that. So now, um, so you've got, when you start to do scanning, and, uh, and I mentioned on your smartphones, then there's a number of programs out there uh, that uh, are free. And we'll, and we'll scan images. Now, what's the difference between taking a photograph and doing a scanned image? The scanned images will flatten the images. They'll make sure it's square. Uh, they do some extra software things that are very helpful when you're trying to take uh, a scanned image with your smartphone. So there's Microsoft Office Lens. Um, there is uh, Apple Notes from Apple, and uh, those are the ones uh, that are most used, the Adobe and the Apple and Microsoft ones. Now, if you want to get very high quality images, even of objects that aren't flat, and you need want to digitize uh, object, 3D objects, then you might want to look at something like the Shotbox, which is a portable light studio. What this does is it makes sure that there are no harsh shadows, you can have uh, standard backgrounds and things like that. And it uses a smartphone once again to take the images, but it also has a stand that lets you put any number of different cameras on the light boxes. They're quite an interesting. We have one of these uh, for use at the uh, BYU Family History Library. Um, now, if you get into photography, there's an infinite, almost infinite, number of add-on items. Uh, if you buy, buy certain kinds of cameras, you find out that there's like a long list of lenses and other things that go with it. The only thing that's really helpful from the standpoint of taking photos of paper and of documents and other objects is the tripod. And uh, 
you can get a tripod that'll work with your with your smartphone, which is what I use uh, on occasion to take pictures at the library of the equipment when I've been making equipment videos, and other times when I just need to make sure the camera doesn't move. Because the biggest problem you're going to find with cameras is that they move. Now, in case you get enamored with camera equipment and you think that somehow or another your equipment, uh, the equipment that you buy is going to make you give, give you better images and better things, you can spend. And you can see if you want to spend, um, you can either that or buy a new car for the cost of a Hasselblad camera, um, which is granted right now the uh, absolute there's nobody in the in the camera world that won't admit that Hasselblad has the best cameras and those are the ones they took to the moon these are the cameras that people use when they are you know really serious about taking photos but to drop down you can get an iPhone Pro Max from around uh, just over a thousand dollars and uh, it is it presently has 48 megapixel camera and it's uh, uh, as good as and as replacing a lot of the point and shoot cameras out there now. So hardly any of the major manufacturers are making what we call point and shoot. That's less lesser cost cameras anymore because they cannot compete with with smartphones. And as they continue to come out, and the promise of what's happening with the next round of Apple uh, iPhones and the other computer uh, cameras that uh, compete with it, like Samsung and and uh, any Android devices out there, they're all the cameras are all as good as you will ever need to do uh, to do it to do thing. Uh, you can buy a high quality flatbed scanner for under hundred dollars, by the way. And then I've got all this equipment that I'm showing here at the library that will help you get through. Uh, that kinds of information. So what's the what's the ultimate key? Well, here's another one. This is a Caesar. It's called Caesar uh, Pro Professional Book Scanner. It's a 24 megapixel camera, and it takes um, and it, it does a marvelous job of flattening pages. And it's only about seven hundred dollars. If you wanted to get in, and if you're going to do a lots and lots of scanning. Uh, you may find that this is tremendously faster than what you have on any place else. So the whole key of this is to preserve the information and put it into a format that it can be shared with the family so that these photos aren't locked up in boxes and trunks and closets around the world and that they're able to be shared and that we have a, the combined collection of all the history of our families together. So that's where we want to be, is in the preservation and sharing business. So that puts us at the end. Thanks for watching. Did anybody guess where that uh, that gate, uh, that's the, the over the gate? It's over the gate to the Palace of Versailles in, in Paris.